I'm Dave Booz, and I'm pastor of Hebron Independent Church of Cade, South Carolina. Thank you for joining us in our ongoing study, Seeking Wisdom in Troubled Times. Today's lesson is When Towers Fall. Let me remind you of the limitations of our task. If we attempt to study every passage of Scripture and read every story in our struggle to discover wisdom, we will soon be overwhelmed and become frustrated. But neither should we skip through the Bible seeking proof texts and proverbs and sayings that we can easily remember. As I have selected certain passages, please be reminded that we had two questions we began as in our study. First of all, what does this certain passage teach us about the wisdom of God? And secondly, what does it reveal concerning our own search for wisdom? Today we shall look at the 11th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 9. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. However, before I turn to this passage, I want to look at a modern parable that's based on an event that we too easily recognize. The World Trade Center is a complex of buildings in Lower Manhattan, New York City. In 1973, when the World Trade Center opened, the Twin Towers were the tallest buildings in the world. They became the pride of New York City a symbol of the economic power of the city and our nation, and also a symbol of globalism. But unfortunately, these symbols soon attracted hatred and terrorism. In September 11th of 2001, Al-Qaeda terrorists flew two passenger planes, including the passengers, into these buildings. And in less than 100 minutes, both buildings fell to the ground. Thousands of people died and Lower Manhattan was covered with debris and dust. Rescue and recovery efforts began immediately, and shock and disbelief went across our nation as millions watched these events on TV. After eventually, the only sign of hope that any could find was a steel cross that was found in the ruins of the buildings. And this became a subtle reminder to those men and women who were working on those grounds, as well as to our nation, that God's presence is still with us in the midst of tragedy. But after the site was cleared and the new tower was erected, it became an act of national pride, perhaps even of defiance against those who dared to attack us in the first place. I don't think that I'm stretching this too far to compare our national disaster with the story of Babel. Let me read the text. It's in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake, bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from, all, from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The Bible reveals that the descendant of Noah began to migrate from the mountains of northwest Ararat down into the plains of Shinar a level and fertile place where they could grow crops and where they could settle, an area today we call Iraq. They started building houses and villages. They took the clay from the riverbeds to make fire-hardened brick, and they cemented these together with the tar or the bitumen, which came from the tar pits, which were quite widespread throughout that oil-rich country. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah and he became the first urban planner and the first land developer. He and the men began to say, let's build a city. Let's build a tower that reaches to heaven. Make a name for ourselves so that we won't be scattered throughout all over, all over the earth. 
What could possibly be wrong with such a dream? Well, first of all, it's directly contrary to the purpose that God gave Adam and Eve when he created man. It's contrary to his purpose as expressed in Genesis chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. In the image of God, he created male and female. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God expressed in his purpose for creation that Adam and his descendants were to spread throughout the entire world and become stewards over all the earth, not just to a small part of it. And then when Noah and his sons prepared to leave the ark after the great flood, God sent them forth with these same words that he had given to Adam and Eve. As for you, be fruitful and multiply and increase in numbers. Multiply on the earth and, and increase upon it. So in Babel, man was directly contradicting God's initial purpose for them. Cities today are often the greatest expression of man's creative abilities, of his scientific and technological skills, and of his political ambitions. The towers and the great buildings that men build often carry the names of their designers, or the man who built them, or the ones who finance their construction. Cities have become measured by tall buildings and extravagant universities and magnificent sports arenas and stadiums and complexes. And if you will notice, whenever a new stadium or college building is proposed or needed, the appeal usually goes to the civic and corporate pride or to the pride of those who donate money or to the alumni who support that particular college. And we don't know exactly why Babel felt the need to build a tower. Perhaps it became their first citadel or fortress to watch over and protect the city. But like many of the ancient sites, it also became a statement of their religious beliefs and their practices. And from their very beginning, Babylon became a center of false religion. They began to practice astrology as they went to the tower and looked into the skies and to the stars. It became other occultic practices as well. And they became widespread. And if one God is good, then many gods must be better. And Babylon had a list of gods and goddesses that was like that of Egypt and Assyria and Greek and Rome and so many other places, including the Eastern religions. They had a God or a goddess for every occasion, for every need. And each one of these gods and goddesses also had a need that needed to be pleased. The Bible is written from the perspective of God's people, from Israel, of Jews, written from the viewpoint of Jerusalem, looking at the rest of the world. And Babylon has always been seen and is still considered by many to be the center of all false religion and worship. To understand that, read the 47th chapter of Isaiah's prophecies, the book of Daniel, and Revelation chapter 17 and 18. In Romans chapter 1, verses 21 or 20 through 25, Paul is speaking, and he makes this statement. <clears throat> he explains why it is so easy to, for man to replace the one true God with false gods and idols. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God to images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. Amen. They desired in Babel to make a name for themselves, a reputation for themselves among all the people of the world. They wanted to be known in the world. They wanted to be recognized for their wealth and their technology and their culture. Has anything really changed today? 
America has had for some time a certain pride, perhaps even arrogance, as some in the world have called it. We lead the world in science and technology and in commerce, in our standards of living, in our athletics. And many of the other nations of the world watched and they learned their lessons too well. And they have rapidly caught up with us and in some cases are beginning to surpass us. While we maintain the pretense that we have faith in God and are seeking his wisdom, many nations do not, including China and India and Indonesia and the Persian Gulf nations and so many other parts of the world. Maybe we would do well to remember the warnings from God's word. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit goes before the fall. Or in Isaiah 23, 9, where the prophet says, the Lord Almighty has planned it to bring low the pride of all glory and to humble all those who are renowned in the earth. Paul gives us a more personal plea in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. If you think you are standing firm, be careful lest you fall. Pride, whether it be personal or national or in a community, always comes between man and his God. Look at the words in Genesis 11, verse 5. But the Lord came down to see. He came down from heaven to see the city, to see the tower, that, and to observe what men were building. The men were speaking one language. There was no lapse of understanding between those who had the vision and those who were doing the work of construction. All the men of Babylon had one vision and one voice, and they were not being led or ordered by God. God said, if we let them continue in this way, there is no limit to what man can do. Does not that seem to be the thought of our world today? There's no limit to what man can do. Why did God come down? Because of man's arrogance? Because of his accomplishments? Because of his dreams? Well, I think that in spite of all of these, man had a need that was so great that he could not solve it. He had a hunger that was so deep he could not fill it. And he needed God and would not even recognize it. If God had allowed man to go on his own way and do his own thing, man could have been content and he would have been doomed because false religion never answers man's true needs. Worldly accomplishments of man cannot fulfill what he desires. God came down and showed the man that there was a gap, a distant gap between the creator and his creation. A gap that man cannot fill, a gap he cannot span by building a tower, a gap that is not in space between heaven and earth, but a gap that is within his own heart and his own life. And it is a gap that only God can fill. The emphasis is laid upon the fact that God confused their languages. Man could not communicate with God, and now he could not communicate with other men. The confusion is not simply of the tongue, but also of the minds and the hearts. A confusion that would not be answered again until the gospel of Jesus Christ was delivered in the languages of all men on the day of Pentecost, and even now is being proclaimed to all nations throughout the world. Babel, confusion. If we take an honest look at the cities of our nation and the nations of our world, it seems that confusion prevails. New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, Portland, Baltimore, Shanghai, Beijing, Paris, Cairo, all around the world, all these cities have confusion. And we can blame the economics, we can blame the politics, we can blame the infrastructure needs, we can blame climate change or anything else we like. <clears throat> but the primary cause of confusion in our world is man's separation from God and man's need for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pride must be laid aside in place of repentance and confession. Sin must be abandoned in the search for God's righteousness. Self must be submitted to his lordship. And only then will confusion be able to submit to God's wisdom. The towers that man builds will eventually fall. Listen to the words of David 
In Psalm chapter 18, verse 2, and also in 144, verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer and my strength, in whom I will trust. He is my buckler and my horn of my salvation and my high tower. And also in Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run to it and are safe. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, the lesson today shows us that as we search for your wisdom, we can try all kinds of worldly ways to find it. We can try to build ourselves a name and a reputation. We can try to speak the languages of those around us. But Lord, we will not find wisdom if we seek for it someplace other than you. So Lord, help us to turn to you. Help us to seek that relationship with you that comes through Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you might help us in our search daily. Lord, we may build the towers, but the towers will fall. Lord, we pray that you will be our strong and mighty tower. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you for being with me today. And I pray that God will bless you, that you will allow God to be your tower, your fortress, your strong and mighty tower in all times of trouble. Thank you again, and God bless.